All right, well, now into Acts chapter 13, where we're going to see a number of these themes repeated uh, this morning. <clears throat> Our text is relatively short compared to the ones we have been looking at, uh, but it's, it is pretty full. It has a lot of encouragement, a lot of instruction for us. Acts 13, uh, verses 44 through 52. Let's all carefully listen uh, to this reading because this is God's Word. Beginning in verse 44, the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Well, may the Lord bless His word to our hearing this morning. Well, again, last week, it perhaps would have been good to read the, a little bit of the text from last week to kind of get us up to speed on what we're looking at here, but let me do that now. Last week, we were noting, particularly from this passage, how Paul would accommodate or fit his message to his audience. He didn't approach different people in the same way. With the Jews, he could assume something very, very important, very helpful that they at least would respect the Scripture. So he went into the Scriptures right away, beginning with God's promise to Abraham to send the Messiah, the one through whom all the nations would be blessed. He traced its fulfillment through the Exodus, the wilderness wanderings, the conquest of Canaan, the time of the judges, to David, and then finally the fulfillment of his promise to raise up a son of David. Now, he did that, of course, to show God's faithfulness to his, his promise, to emphasize God's goodness, because it was an infinite mercy for God even to give this promise to Abraham or to anyone in the first place, to send the Messiah through whom all the nations would be blessed. But it was even more so, uh, God was even more gracious to fulfill this promise in spite of their unfaithfulness. Remember what he said to Abraham when he called him into covenant? Abraham, I want you to walk before me and be blameless. Now, God was going to make sure that happened. It wasn't, as it were, somehow a condition that Abraham had to meet before God would fulfill his promise. We see that because, you know, throughout Scripture because Abraham failed. So did Isaac, so did Jacob, so did the, the sons of Jacob. All of Israel, they failed. It depends on God's goodness. But God does call us to walk before him and to be blameless, and only He can give us the power to do this. Well, He didn't give the power to everyone. Israel failed miserably, but in spite of that, God was still gracious, and He fulfilled that promise. By the way, I just wanted to mention, you know, th this can be a comfort to us as well as a warning. You know, we will always fail. We need to understand that. You know, sometimes it, we go to one of two ways with that. We either think, well, because I'm going to fail, I might as well just fail so that God can be gracious. Well, God, uh, Paul says we should never think that way. We should never use God's grace for an excuse for sin. But the other way we should use it is this, that I want to be perfect, I want to do what's right, but I fail. And yet to know that God in His faithfulness is going to help us make it to the end, Right? That's why, I mean, our failure is why when God determines to save, that it, He has to be the one to do it. That's the reason why He sent Jesus into the world, because we could not do it, even with the help of the Holy Spirit, which comes to us 
from the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope of heaven has to be in Jesus and in Him alone. It has to be in God. His work through His Son, His working in us, not our own efforts. So this can be a tremendous encouragement that God is going to be faithful even during those times when we, when we fail, when we are unfaithful. Now, from, from there, from God's faithfulness, even in spite of their unfaithfulness, to uh, God brings the Messiah through His Son, Paul preaches Christ from the Son of David. He tells them how God sent John to get the people ready, how John was pointing to the one who was coming after him, who's, uh, the one whose sandals he was not even worthy to stoop and untie. This one who was coming was no mere man, no mere creature, but rather he was the Son of God. He, uh, Paul pointed out how the rulers did not recognize who he was, but they fulfilled the Scriptures by condemning him and handing him over to the Romans to be crucified. That after he died and was laid in a tomb, he was raised again to life, the third day, according to the Scriptures, that He appeared to many witnesses over many days, and how everyone who believes in Him is freed, not only from the guilt of sin, which would oppress them down into hell forever, but also the power of sin. They were freed from that which the law could not free them, and how important it was they trust in Him, because if they didn't, God's curse would fall on them. Now, we need to realize that when we come into the world, all of us are already under the curse. That's something that a lot of people don't understand. We don't come into the world neutral. We come into the world guilty, and we're under the curse of the broken covenant that God made with Adam. Jesus is the only way that we can escape this curse and inherit the blessing, and that's why Paul was offering Christ to the Jews, but why he also told them that if they do not receive Him, they will perish. They will perish for their sins. They're under God's curse. Everyone is apart from Christ. Now, this is how Paul preached to the Jews. Again, he was able to assume that they respected the Scriptures, but we'll see later in his sermons to the Gentiles that his approach will be different. He will begin by appealing to God's revelation in nature to demonstrate the true God and then bring it to the Scriptures and that's because they would not respect the Scriptures because they had no reason to. They would look at it as some religious book of the Jews. Now, that is what R.C. Sproul is basically teaching us in the evenings. This kind of methodology, as Paul, first of all, points to natural revelation to prove that God exists before He comes to Scripture, R.C. is telling us we need to demonstrate or at least again show those who already are convinced but who are suppressing that truth that God really does exist, to give them absolute proof, and once demonstrating that He exists, show the Scripture is His Word, and then argue from the Scriptures the things that they need to hear. So we need to begin where our audience is, and then bring them where they need to be, bring them to the one they need to know. Now, we also saw, lastly, the results of His preaching, um, many were powerfully affected, and they begged Paul and Barnabas to come back and to teach them more the next Sabbath, okay? Now, the Lord opened their eyes to see the value of what it was they were bringing to them, and it really isn't until we see the value of what God is telling us in His Word that we will really hunger and thirst for more of what He tells us. I mean, why is it that some people devour the Bible and others barely crack it open? It's because those who devour it see its worth. They love it, and they want to know more of it because the God they love reveals Himself in here, and He reveals how we can please Him, how we can honor Him. Well, those who believe the message, of course, follow. They beg, they beg that they would come back and teach them more, but they also followed. And then Paul and Barnabas did something which I think is, is what our Lord would do realizing that not everybody who was following them was necessarily born again, just as it was with the crowds that followed Jesus. Remember how Jesus said things to really start winnowing the chaff from the wheat? Uh, he, they urged those who were following to continue in the grace of God, to make sure that they were trusting in Jesus alone, 
and that they were really doing this because they loved Him. You know, we're going to be reminded in our sermon this morning that there are different reasons why people follow Jesus, and it's not always because they love Him. So we need to be able to discern whether we really love Him, and if we do, to continue in that love because that is the grace God gives to us, the grace of the Holy Spirit. If we have Him, we know that we have Christ. If we don't have Him, because, and we see that because we don't really love Him, then we know we need Jesus Christ. Okay, so these were the positive results. But we know the gospel always produces more than one result, right? There's two kinds of results. By God's grace, it softens the heart. You know, God by His Holy Spirit works through it to awaken, to convert, you know, to draw people to Himself. But as we just saw in our Scripture reading, it can also be used to harden them. You know, if, if the Spirit of God isn't using it to soften hearts, then basically when those who are dead in trespass and sin are exposed to the Word of God, it has the opposite effect. It actually incites sin in them. As Paul said, you know, uh, he thought he was alive at one time uh, apart from the law, but when the law came, uh, sin became alive and he died. Now, I don't think that was talking about the time when Paul was a child and he finally reached the age where he could understand and then he became culpable. I think it means that Paul really didn't understand the law until the Spirit of God convicted him and showed him what the law really meant. And then when it became alive, he died because the law killed him. He realized that he was dead. Well, that's exactly how people respond. When the Spirit of God, as it were, brings it home, and yet that person doesn't have a changed heart, it incites their sin. And so when that happens, it, it makes them even harder, okay? So it's going to have one of two effects, soften or harden. But this text tells us that even when it does harden, the Lord still uses it to advance His kingdom. So this morning, I want us to consider two things. I want us to consider the Jews' jealousy. And basically, they're, they're uh, fighting against Paul and Barnabas that brings the blessings of the gospel to the Gentiles. And then secondly, the Jews' persecution that ultimately brings joy to the disciples. So we see here two negative effects that bring two positive results. Now, first of all, the Jews' jealousy that brings blessings to the Gentiles. Now, Luke first tells us that the next Sabbath, after what we saw happen last week, almost the entire city had gathered to hear Paul and Barnabas. Now, apparently those who had heard them and believed the message spent that entire week telling everybody they knew about the things that they had heard. And they urged them to come and hear it for themselves. You know, when we're excited about something, we tend to talk about it, don't we? We tend to, to try to slip it into every conversation. Whatever it is that consumes us comes, tends to come out of us. That's what we should be doing with the gospel. We should be consumed with, with the gospel and with God's truth so that it's always coming out of us when we're speaking with other people, especially unbelievers but even with, with each other. That should be the center of our conversation as Christians. I mean, that's what Christian fellowship is all about, isn't it? Talking about the things that have to do with, with reality as opposed to this world that we see that's only temporary. Now, not everybody who came to hear the gospel on this occasion or to hear Paul and Barnabas were necessarily genuinely interested. Some of the Jews and the God-fearers who were present, they were there because it was a Sabbath day and they were there to worship again. Some of the Gentiles likely came just because they wanted to see what all the hype was about, you know, what they had been hearing all week long. They wanted to hear it for themselves. But others were awakened by the Spirit and were being drawn by Him because, as we're going to see in a few verses, this was the day of their salvation. Now, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and they began to argue against Paul. They began to contradict what he was saying because their pride was provoked. Now, pride, as we know, God resists the proud. Pride is an ugly thing. It can be so difficult for anyone, even Christians, right, to watch somebody do something better than they can do. In this case, to see somebody else receive the honor of being a teacher, one who's bringing God's truth, rather than they. 
This, these were likely the Jewish leaders who were doing this, those who wanted these Jews to look to them for spiritual guidance, to respect them as spiritual fathers. I don't know if you remember this, but Matthew tells us in his gospel that this was the reason why the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem handed Jesus over to Pilate for crucifixion. It was obvious even to Pilate that they did it because they were jealous of Jesus, because he was much more popular than they were. Now, I think there's a lesson in here for us as well. I mean, God was being glorified, and we should always rejoice when God is glorified. We shouldn't be jealous. If somebody does something that's honoring to the Lord, we shouldn't look at them and say, I don't like them because they're doing better than I am. We should look at them and say, you know what, I am thankful that God has raised this person up to give him glory because I want God basically to raise every one of his people up to give him as much glory as they can because he deserves it. Remember what happened when um, uh, Moses needed additional help to judge the Israelites and God sent his spirit upon, I think it was like 80 of the elders that were in the camp and they began prophesying and then Joshua comes to Moses and he was jealous for, for Moses and he says, these men are prophesying in the camp. Really, this is something that should be yours. And uh, Moses said, you know, I would that all of God's people would actually receive the Spirit and become prophets like that because that gives glory to God. We should be concerned about God's receiving glory rather than, than our getting recognition for this or for that. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that when it comes to one another, we should be trying to outdo each other in showing honor to each other. We are never to take honor to ourselves. Jesus says, the one who humbles himself to become the least is the one who is the greatest in his kingdom. Now, Luke tells us that they also began to blaspheme. You know, that's, that's basically they're, they're saying things about God that are dishonoring to him. Now, they may not have been doing this knowingly against God. They were probably directing it against his son, the Lord Jesus. But in blaspheming Jesus, they were rejecting, obviously, him. They were rejecting the gospel. You know, it's so important to listen to the gospel because it is the only way that we can be forgiven of our sins and be reconciled to God. But they would not listen. They gave up this great blessing. They rejected the blessing God had for them, but their rejection brought blessing to someone else. It brought it to the Gentiles. We read in verse 46, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Now, again, that was the situation in those days before 70 AD when the Lord destroyed the temple in the Old Testament system. The Jews had the priority. They had the singular privilege of being the first to be offered the gospel, okay? And again, that's for the reason. The reasons are because God called Abraham, made his covenant with him, made his covenant with his children, not only to be their God, but also to send his Messiah through them and to send his Messiah to them, first of all. Now, if they had received him, they would have had a second singular privilege, and that is that they would have become the light of the world. You know how in the Old Testament, Israel is basically seen to be, in a certain sense, the light of the world because there was only light in Israel. That's the only place God's truth in Scripture actually existed, and people had to come to Israel in order to be saved. Well, there was a second phase to that where they would literally become the light of the world by receiving their Messiah and becoming His witnesses. If they had received Him, they would be doing the very thing that Paul and Barnabas were doing to them at that moment, which was preaching the gospel, being a light to them. Now, this is one sense in which the Lord's promise to Abraham was to be fulfilled that in his seed or his offspring, in his children, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. First and foremost, it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the promised child of Abraham who brings blessing to the world. But it had another fulfillment. It also referred to the Jews, okay? Because it was through their receiving of the Lord Jesus Christ 
that the Lord would have evangelized the world. They would have been a light to the world, but they rejected Him. And as we saw last week, where there's great privilege, there's also great responsibility. And when great privilege is rejected, then judgment is much more severe. By the way, we see that recurring throughout history. That's just the way it is. The places where the Lord showed His greatest mercies in this world, His greatest outpourings of His Holy Spirit, in Israel where He sent His Son and where He sent the Pentecostal revival, in, in Europe where He gave the Reformation revival, in England where He brought the Puritan revival, in New England which is on the eastern seaboard where He sent the Great Awakening. These are now the places of the world which are the most spiritually dead. And the reason is because God gave great light, great privilege, but great light was rejected. And so they fall into even greater darkness than they had before. And so this having fallen upon the Jews, their rejecting of the Lord Jesus Christ, their rejection of God's plan for them to be the light of the world, as Jesus told His disciples to move on, uh, when a town or a village would reject their message, now Paul and Barnabas move on to the Gentiles because this is what the Lord commanded through the Scriptures. He says in verse 47, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. This is not a quote of any particular verse in Scripture, but rather it's like a composite quote from several verses, and it gives the essence of God's plan. Uh, he meant Israel to be a light, but they're not a light, so that light switches now to another group, which we're going to see in just a moment. But it is that salvation may be brought to the ends of the earth. And so they move on now with the light to the nations, which is what basically the ends of the earth are all about. Israel's privilege has been taken away from them. Jesus said that in the parable of the, of the vineyard, remember? And it has been given to a nation that will bring forth its fruits, that will do this work faithfully. It's been given to the church because who are the true children of Abraham? Not his natural offspring, but his spiritual offspring, right? We are the true children of Abraham, Paul tells us, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are now the ones through whom he will bring the gospel to the world and through the gospel also blessing. That's why Jesus says to His disciples on the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world, not the Jewish nation, but you who believe in Me, Jesus says. And that's also why He commands us, just two verses later, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And I think we need to see in this not only a life that is conformed to Christ, but also communication of the gospel. That's part of the light, right? The truth that transforms and basically, by God's grace, we're living proof. Now, when the Gentiles heard the gospel was coming to them, they rejoiced and they glorified God's words. In other words, they received it and they glorified and honored and vindicated the fact that it's God's truth. The Jews' rejection did not stop the kingdom of heaven from moving forward. It only succeeded in redirecting it to someone else, to the Gentiles. When the Lord closes one door, He opens another door. The gospel continues to move forward. And then Luke continues, And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Now, these are the verses that Calvinists love and that Arminians typically don't understand, right? Because it says here that those whom God appointed, those whom He chose to save, believed. They trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. As many as have been appointed to eternal life, believed. The Bible tells us God is the one who does the appointing. God is the one who does the choosing. Paul writes in Ephesians 1.4 that He, that is God, chose us, in Him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, before the foundation of the world, that is before He created anything, so that we might be holy and blameless in Him. Okay? 
That is so perfectly clear, but it doesn't make sense to someone who thinks that man ultimately is the one who makes the final choice. And of course, the evidence that God has actually chosen us is the fact that we believe, that we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and we follow Him. Remember what Jesus says in John 10, verses 27 through 28, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. You know, I contrast that to what R.C. Sproul was saying in the, um, uh, the sermon he was saying this morning where Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, many are going to come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name and, and do all these many wonderful works? And Jesus is going to turn to them and say, depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice iniquity. And the point is, they believed that they knew the Lord Jesus Christ, but they didn't really know Him, and Jesus didn't know them in a saving relationship. And the evidence was that they were practicing evil. They weren't practicing righteousness. The evidence that we are chosen by God and that we're actually saved is that we hear the voice of Jesus, and Jesus knows us, and we follow Him, and He gives eternal life to us, and we will never perish. But Again, the evidence, the evidence to us is that we follow Him. If we follow Him because He chose us, He says, we will never perish. We won't hear those words of Jesus, depart from me, I never knew you. But instead, we'll hear the words, you know, uh, enter into the eternal kingdom prepared uh, for, for you from the foundation of the earth. Okay? And those are the words we want to hear. Now, when Spurgeon on one occasion was asked about the members in his church, who seemingly were converted but had left the faith, and I imagine there was probably a hint of Calvinism isn't really true after all because here are people who believed and who basically apostatized. Well, Spurgeon said this, that these people must have been his converts rather than the Lord's converts because the Lord's converts never fall away. And the point is that, you know, people can persuade people to follow Jesus. You know, there are people who are very persuasive speakers, like, like Spurgeon. And Spurgeon did not believe that everybody who was attending his church was necessarily saved. He knew there were people there who just liked listening to him because he was such, so fascinating to listen to. He was one of the greatest tourist attractions in, in London. People would always come to hear Spurgeon. And that's why P.T. Barnum also wanted to hire him for his three-ring circus because he could attract people. But... The thing is, we're not saved by being attracted to a particular individual or a charismatic person preaching the gospel. We're only saved by trusting in Jesus, okay? So we might persuade Jesus, or not Jesus, persuade people to follow Jesus for a while, but only Jesus, only God, can give the kind of love that's necessary to make a person follow Him faithfully. And the point here is simply this, that's why we need to pray that the Lord would show mercy to those that we seek to bring to Jesus Christ. Our job is not to try to persuade them to follow for a, a short time. Our job is to bring, them, bring the gospel to them that they might come to Christ and be transformed and then follow Him uh, from then on because that's what they want to do. You know, with people who are genuinely the Lord's, you don't have to, to plead and beg with them to do the right thing. They, they do it because they want to do it, because it's in their heart to do it. So that's what we need to pray for is that change of, of heart. Okay, so this first point is the Jews' jealousy brought blessings to the Gentiles, okay? Now, the second point is much briefer. Let me just say this. Secondly, we see the Jews' persecution brought joy to the disciples. Now, Luke tells us that the word continued to spread throughout the entire area. Uh, it seems... The more the Jews resisted, the more they persecuted, the more the word was gaining momentum. You know, now it wasn't just Paul and Barnabas who basically, you know, they're the only ones, uh, well, it seems like they're the only ones mentioned, but there may have been a few more people with them, but they were the ones pretty much doing most of the work. But now it wasn't just Paul and Barnabas. There were all these converted Jews and Gentiles who were also spreading the gospel. Now, look again at the results of this persecution of the Jews against them and see what, what effect it had on the church. Uh, 
You know, it's been said, uh, you've heard numerous times that the, uh, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It, when a persecution comes against the church, it doesn't snuff the church out. It causes the church to grow. It may, some of the members of the church may end up giving their lives for Christ, but many more people come to faith in Jesus, and, and that's what we see here. Persecution is good for the church. The more the enemy fights against the kingdom of God, the more the kingdom advances. Now, that's, that reminds me of an image that is in Pilgrim's Progress. If, if you're familiar with the book, perhaps you remember when uh, he goes through the straight gates and the first thing he comes to is Mr. Interpreter's house and he goes in there in order to learn more about the gospel, right? And in one of the rooms, there's this fire that's burning and there's a man who's standing over the fire and he's pouring water on it. But the more water he pours on it, the, the hotter the flame gets and, and the, 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 the larger it burns. And then, you know, Christian uh, asks the interpreter, well, how can this be? And Mr. Interpreter takes him behind this wall and shows him a man who was secretly uh, feeding the fire with this oil through a secret tube that's keeping the fire going hotter and hotter. And he said, basically, the interpretation of this is Satan is going to try to persecute and try to put out the love that is in the heart of the Christian for the Lord Jesus Christ. But the more he tries to put it out, the hotter and brighter it burns. Not because that person is so strong, but because Christ is feeding it, feeding that fire with the oil of His Holy Spirit. So basically, what's happening here is Satan is, is, is persecuting and he's trying to pour water on this flame, but things are becoming more and more heated, basically, as, as he does. And the gospel is spreading more and there, there's more love and more joy in the Holy Spirit that's just, again, empowering the church. Well, that wasn't the only persecution. Luke tells us that things became even more heated as the gospel began to spread. And in verse 50, we read this. The Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. Basically, they started using the, uh, the secular powers uh, in order to, uh, to do their their work to get rid of this influence. But when that happened, Paul and Barnabas did not become discouraged. They realized that the Lord was again closing this door, but He was opening another door. But before they left, we need to note, they did what their Lord had told the disciples to do during His earthly ministry. They shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them, and they moved on to the next town to Iconium. Basically, that shaking off of the dust means, you know, as, as Jesus told His disciples, even the dust of your city that clings to us, we, we shake off as a testimony against you. The gospel of the kingdom of heaven has come near, and that's going to speak against you in the day of judgment. And that's, the, that's what this warning essentially means to these Jews. But again, this persecution did not stop the gospel. It only redirected it, okay? So the Lord is basically revealing His will through the reception that He is either granting or not granting. And they don't get discouraged. They don't stop. But they keep moving on, which is what Jesus told His disciples to do when they were, remember, bringing the gospel throughout Palestine. If there's any city that doesn't receive you, go to the next city, okay? Don't, don't waste your time there any longer. There are people who need to hear, so many people who need to hear. So lastly, we need to ask the question, did they get discouraged by all this persecution, you know, all this, all this um, you know, um, fighting against them? No, they didn't. Didn't stop them, didn't discourage them. Luke writes that in the middle of this persecution in verse 52, the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now, as I said at the beginning, our Lord tells us that we need to expect persecution when we serve Him, we need to expect trials and difficulties, even, you know, throughout life, no matter what we're doing. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So basically, he never promised we wouldn't be persecuted. He promised we would be persecuted if we're going to live like Jesus Christ, if we're going to live a godly life. But... He also said we should expect that when we suffer, 
that the Lord is going to give to us joy by His Holy Spirit to sustain us. And so, that, you know, it, it really boils down to this, you know, which, which situation would you want to be in? Everything is going well. I'm basically, you know, not really pushing forward. I'm not really being open with my Christianity. I'm seeking my own things. I'm comfortable. And things are going pretty smoothly, you know. Or I'm being persecuted. It's difficult because I'm being open with my Christianity and people don't like it. They're calling me names and, and I'm not in the in-group anymore and so forth. And, and I'm having to face all these difficulties. But I am filled with joy and peace by the Holy Spirit. Okay, which of those situations would you want to be in? You know, the people in this situation are happier than the people in this situation because they have the Holy Spirit. That's the reason why Paul kept going. I mean, again, if we were looking at 2 Corinthians, we see this huge catalog of everything Paul went through for preaching the gospel. And we ask the question, why would anyone want to go through that? Well, it's because when he experienced the fellowship of Christ's sufferings, he also experienced the power of of His resurrection. Now, if we really believe that's true, we shouldn't seek to avoid persecution. I mean, we shouldn't do it because our, we love the Lord and He's called us to, to tell the gospel to other people. And we know that potential is always there. We should do it just for that. But on this other level, as we strive to be faithful and we're willing to face persecution, we can, in that persecution, look forward to His blessing and to know that it's worth whatever we might have to endure. Remember after Paul had been beaten up so many times that he basically was just filled with scars. I mean, today we cringe at the idea of having any scars on our body because they're not pretty. Paul was beaten to a pulp on numerous occasions. I can only imagine what he looked like, but as he looked at all the scars in his body, he gloried in them. And he says, I bear in my body the brand marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did Jesus look like after he was flogged and then crucified, right? Paul says, I've taken that abuse meant for him. And I glory in the fact that he honored me in allowing me to do that. And I imagine that his subjective experience at that time was being so filled with the Spirit and so filled with that pleasure of the Lord that he didn't, wasn't concerned at all about what he looked like. He was concerned only that Jesus be glorified. Well, that's the kind of attitude the Lord wants in us as well. And, and it only comes through pursuing the Lord, being filled with his Holy Spirit, doing his work and his will, you know, stepping out when it's uncomfortable and sharing the gospel with other people, it, it comes to serving Him and being faithful to Him. So may the Lord give us the grace uh, to do that. Again, remembering that whatever happens to us, God's going to work it for blessing. This is the way He works. All right, well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we, and, and ask the Lord to apply this word uh, to us, to our hearts.